Well, Gold Derby fans, there were eight nomination slots this year at the Emmys for single camera picture editing for a drama series. And The Mandalorian from Disney Plus took up three of those slots. They're dominating the category. And I am very pleased to be sitting here with all the nominated editors of this great Star Wars series. I'm Sam Ekman of Gold Derby. And with me, I have Andrew, uh, Andrew S. Eisen, who edited episode two, The Child. Dana E. Glauberman and Dylan Fershine, who uh, did Sanctuary, Chapter 4. And for Chapter 8, Redemption, we have Jeff Siebenick. Thank you all for joining me, and congrats on just dominating this category at the Emmys this year. Thanks for having um, us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having us. So, you know, obviously there's many of you who are editing this show, um, and I'm just kind of curious, what does that do in terms of getting a unified feel for the series? How do you go about that with so many people like Dana, how, how do you um, sort of collaborate with each other to get a unified feel for the show? Well, I was actually the last one on, on board as far as the editors go. Um, Jeff was originally going to cut the whole episode or the whole season. Um, when and when then, I, heard, I tried convincing everybody that I could do the whole thing. And I, <laughs> I, I stuck to that for a long time until I realized that it was not gonna be possible. <laughs> So then Andrew joined the joined the group, well, Dylan first and then Andrew shortly thereafter. And then quickly they realized that they needed a third person and in came me. Um, and really what I had done to start off was um, go through the, the, every episode had been edited in previs. And so uh, just to get a feel for the show and a feel for um, for what the show was about, because I'm not a huge Star Wars uh, super fan or S Star Wars junkie. Uh, although, yeah, although I, Jeff is, um, although I have seen most of, if not all of the, all of the previous Star Wars movies, but um I just kind of went through and, and started watching everything and kind of just went and, and approached scenes as I would normally approach a scene, um, basically to tell the story. And as far as a style goes, you know, that kind of, for me, that kind of came a little bit after, after I would assemble. And if I can, if I can just add to that, I mean, you know, the truth is, um, there is a lot of individuality to all of the episodes. You, you know, each one is directed by a different director. In some cases, two directors had you know, two episodes, or one director had to have two episodes. But um, John Favreau and Dave Filoni were very open to the idea that you know, each episode almost be a standalone. And so they, they did not feel the need for it to have to have this certain cohesive feel, like if you're watching other series, on, on Netflix or other, you know, you feel that there's this very cohesive storyline that just, you know, it just leaves off, it just picks up chapter to chapter. This one um, has a slightly different vibe to it in that way. So um, there is a lot of room for individual um, taste and style. And even for us, like, you know, Andrew direct, or edited two episodes that were directed by two different directors. I did four episodes directed by four different directors and everyone felt a little different. Everything had a bit of a tone difference and a style difference. And but the whole unifying story of the season was kind of what kept it all, you know, glued together. But it, it kind of worked in such a way that, you know, like Taika's episode, it starts off with comedy. It's got great action scenes. Rick's episode was a little bit more like of a sneaky. And it started with the scripts, you know, the scripts were all different too. So it kind of worked as uh, episodic but also as, as like a whole, you know, overarching story. Um, let's, well, Jeff, since you're, you've been ousted as the, the Star Wars nerd in the group, I'll, I'll start with you for this one. Because, uh, you know, the exciting thing to me, I'm also a Star Wars nerd, is that Disney is sort of willing to experiment with the style and tone of one of their biggest franchises. Uh, Star Wars is obviously one of the biggest franchises in the world. Um, so, you know, the, those original films that George Lucas did have such a distinct style to them. And if you think of editing, they did all those classic wipes and fades, but we're going for something different. So how did you all deal with sort of the legacy of those films? Was there sort of pressure to say, I'm gonna do something completely opposite? No, actually we, 
we definitely stuck to the style of the original movies. The first three that came out was like, mm -hmm. that was kind of our blueprint uh, for style, not necessarily tone, but definitely like cinematic style. We, we incorporated the wipes. We incorporated uh, the, I think the biggest thing for me, it's weird because I feel like I'm repeating myself, even though this is the first time for this interview, but the biggest thing for me that kind of like glues the universe together is the sound design. And once you start putting in those classic sounds from the Star Wars movies and you have like the backgrounds and the doors opening and the droid servos and the laser guns, it's, it just becomes Star Wars. It doesn't really matter what the pace or the, or the tone is, right? But then going back to John and Dave, you know, they always set out to, uh, set out to make it as much like the original films as possible by saying, you know, you can't use uh, a sweeping steady cam shot because George wouldn't have done that. Or you have to put the camera where a camera could go. You can't just have it flying over on a drone because George couldn't have done that in 1977. So that was like stylistically how we kept it within the Star Wars, like the tone of the Star Wars movies. Well, not, not tone, and of course there's, there's production design as well that very was a big contribution to that feeling yeah. as well. It really, um, yeah. But we don't have anything to do with production design, Andrew. I'm talking to you. Obviously, there's too there's a, there, but there, but there was never a day where we didn't say something like, "Is that how they would do it back then? Is this what George would have done?" You know, it, we evolved it and we kind of like mutated it as we went. But there was always a real respect and, a, and an admiration to what we were building off of. Right. Um, you know, the biggest, one of the biggest things to emerge from this show is Baby Yoda or the child. Can I ask a yeah. question quick? Are you going to edit this at all? Or do we have to be good? Like, take <laughs> You're this already live, good. Jeff. We go straight through. You're good. Oh, God. <laughs> you're great. <laughs> it's okay. Um, you're, uh, as I was saying, the, one of the biggest things to come out of this was Baby Yoda or the child, as the show uh, refers to him and names him, which has spawned so many memes, but... In terms of editing, it's really, that character is so greatly utilized with reaction shots because it's so expressive and, and um, it's a great storytelling element. So uh, Dylan, how, how did you first discover, how early was it in the process where you first discovered that was gonna be a great tool to use? Well, I think initially they had, hadn't figured they were gonna use the puppet as much as they did. Um, you know, I think that when they first started, they're like, all right, we'll put this in here and probably we'll have to enhance it with CG or replace him. But as people saw what legacy effects could do with their puppet, the, it was, you just kind of fell in love with it. And so it really became um, easy to cut away to him and, and be able to treat him just like any other actor. I mean, they were really amazing. Jeff has a great story when, they, when he actually came down to see the puppet on stage, but you know, just the way, you know, moving the ears, the way he blinks, the way he turns, it's incredible the way the guys work together to, to make that happen. And There's also that great story that Deb told about Werner Herzog, like almost scolding the people on the set. Don't be cowards, use the puppet, it's magical. This is cinema, don't, don't augment this with CGI. Like he like got angry at the crew for even suggesting that they would replace it at one point or another. You know, that was a, that was a hilarious. Uh, right. Day. To give some context to that, there was a scene where he, he did this whole scene with the baby in the pram. And then they did, they said, let's get one without the baby in the pram. We'll replace him if we need to. And he's <laughs> like, what are you talking about? Put it, keep him in there. I'm not doing a, a take without the baby in the pram. You don't need to replace him. And he was absolutely right. I'd say probably 95% of what we see in season one is uh, of the baby is probably all puppet. And when we were doing our VFX, today. like the biggest note was, no, that doesn't look like the puppet or the puppet couldn't do that you literally, we would literally make the CGI try to look as much like the puppet as possible. Because mm -hmm. um, it's real, it feels real. It's like it's the does. thing that lives and it's, it's, that's why you love it. And people love puppet, yeah, the, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and one of the things that I'm always fascinated by with editors is that you get all this footage, actors might do, uh, on set there might be many, many takes and you can sort of ship, sift through those and if an actor is doing something different every time, if they're giving different nuances, you can really shape a performance uh, in the final product. So uh, I'm curious to hear from you all. We'll start with, we can start with Andrew, but what do you really look for when you're looking at the takes? What is kind of what makes the perfect performance to you? 
Um, <laughs> that's a, that's an interesting question. I mean, I look at it the way I look at any, when I watch dailies, I, I, I watch them all. My, my process is that I get the dailies in the morning and I watch them all before I cut anything. I just sit and watch and I take notes and I, um, and I just look for the moments that are the, that are just the best, uh, that just feel best to me. I mean, that's really all I can do. And then I, uh, you know, and then I start assembling and then the great thing uh, that we, you know, that we have on this show is that we have many characters that are, don't have, you know, faces. So we can, we can move those things around. We can, if there's a reaction shot I want of Mando where it's just like a cock of the head and he did it somewhere else earlier in the scene, we can certainly take that and put it anywhere we want and manipulate the, uh, you know, the emotion or the, you know, or, or the, you know, just the, 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 the um, intent of the scene by, by, you know, moving things around like that. But, um, you know, as far as the process, it's the same as anything, whether I was, you know, whether I was cutting a movie like Juno, Tana, um, or, 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 or Guardians of the Galaxy or something like that. I mean, really, you're, you're just looking for best performances. You're looking for, um, you know, for those little those special moments. Yeah. Um, and I want to talk about each, each episode, all of you have these intense action sequences in every episode. Um, some of them are intimate one-on-one uh, -on -one fights. Some of them are large scale battles. You know, uh, Andrew, you have that mud horn battle. Dana and, and Dylan, you have this really great knock them down fight scene between Mando and Kara and the ATST attack, of course, later on. And then of course, in the finale of, uh, of Jeff, you have the Moff Gideon standoff and then the TIE fighter sequence. I would love to hear from all of you, um, what, what is sort of the key to building tension in a sequence like that, but also keeping it focused on a character-driven narrative? Because that's ultimately what this series is. Dana, we could start with you. Oh, of course you have to start with you. <laughs> um, you know, to, to build tension in scenes like that, I think there, it's already inherent in the scene because of a big ATST battle or an actual fight scene. So, um, you know, I think that something that, that actually helps build that tension is music. And, you know, when you have Cara Dune and Mando actually fist fighting, um, the choreography there is already... The choreography is already like spelling out how that how the fight is supposed to go. Um, so whether or not they're actually taking punches, um, you know, you you kind of have to, as far as cutting goes, take out those pauses. But it's all it's all in in rhythm. Um, as far as the ATST battle, you know, the ATST was originally a light on a stick or a light on a crane, I should say. And so it took a lot of imagination on our part to, you know, try and try and imagine what this, what this scene was gonna develop into. And a lot of that is just going off of reactions of the villagers and these quiet moments of, you know, of anticipation of what's gonna happen. Um, and yeah, it, I don't know. <laughs> Whenever I'm cutting an action scene, I'm always checking in with the human element or the 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 the, the hero of the scene. Okay, it's like you always want to see cause and effect, and either that's a look or a, 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 like he shoots his blaster, and you want to see where it goes. You want to see what he hits, and then somebody shoots back at him. You want to see what he does, and it's always kind of like finding that balance between, you know, checking in with the characters, like in the 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 climactic battle in um. 108 when they're fighting in the courtyard and IG walking in and you've got grief coming out the door shooting you've got Cara Dune in the window blasting through the window you've got Mando trying to go for the gun you've got all these different elements that are kind of all happening at the same time and it's just about when you feel like okay well as the viewer me I want to know what's happening to this person so that's where I'm going to cut to it and I want to know what's happening to this person and then I see like off in the corner there's IG so I'm going to go back and check in with IG then I'm going to check in with the baby then I want to check in with Moff Gideon you know it's like you kind of start to sit there and you go this is what I want to see right now and this is why I'm going to cut to it at that point in the fight you know what I mean especially when there's a lot of elements stacking on top of each other that's when it gets the most fun because you can kind of like play around with how to if I if I show Moff Gideon coming around the corner and then I cut to Mando fighting with somebody else, that's going to raise that tension because Mando doesn't know 
that the bad guy is coming up behind him. You know what I mean? You always kind of like, it's, it's about doling out information. Like when do you show what the character knows and when do you show what the character doesn't know? Andrew, do you want to jump in or Dylan? Any other thoughts? I, I'm sorry, I've got, I've been distracted. Um, <laughs> we also have, I, I, I'm just being told that we have, we, I have a heart out now in about five minutes. My I'm meeting. Oh, that's okay. We'll get you out. Good. So, we, we, I know, I know. <laughs> Jeff, you can't wait. For the, <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I wasn't full. I was a little distracted in that moment. What, what was the... Well, um, just tell us before you have to go out, let's uh, tell us about how you built tension in that Mudhorn battle, because that was one of my favorite moments oh. of the of the season. Well, it, well, I mean, actually, I did hear a little bit of, about what Jeff was saying, and it is true. You know, you're cutting for what makes you feel, um, you know, uh, what what gives you that, you know, you know the goosebumps. And um, obviously, in that particular case, the the previs was very helpful because that a scene like that really does have to be sort of laid out ahead of time so that they know, you know, how they're going to you know, put where they're going to put the camera, where the mud horn is going to be. So, um, you know, Jeff had cut previs for that. So there was a lot of, there was already a blueprint uh, before I even came in um, on that. But we did, you know, having said that, the scene, the scene evolved and it changed. Uh, Rick uh, from Ewa, the director, had some really uh, interesting ideas that he wanted to incorporate into the scene that weren't there. So, you know, the probably one of the more, t you know, it's kind of action-packed, up until you know you know he's being he gets thrown out of the cave he gets knocked on his ass he he tries to fight it he keeps getting knocked down and and you know that's um you know that's that's good you know standard action stuff and then and then when he gets totally his he gets his bell rung and he get you know he kind of passes out and, and he kind of wakes up and he's all dazed and then he sees this mud horn about to come at him we sort of suspended time you know we we really wanted to draw the moment out where we realized this is it, like, you know, Mando is doomed. And so we, we kind of like, you know, obviously if you, if you thought of it logically, that thing would have already been barreling over him, you know, a minute before it did, but we kind of kept the mud horn back there kind of, you know, um, what's the term you guys have dogs and cats or, you know, he's just sort of like, um, he's trying to, uh, he's just sort of like, He's just rearing, he's just getting kind of ready to sort of attack. We kind of keep him back there. We, we stick with Mando. We do this, you know, we, we kind of push in on him and we, we pull out the sound so that we sort of can really get inside Mando's head there for a moment when we really get the sense that he is, this is it, all is lost and like what's going to happen now. And then, you know, the, the Mudhorn starts to charge. Again, we double cut and double cut so that it's, um, it just keeps, it feels like it's coming at him forever. And then just as we think it's about to take him down, we cut to that incredible shot of a hand coming up, close up of a hand. And, and that was sort of a very, that was the moment that I think the, the audience finally understood that this, you know, this baby has some powers that his predecessor, if you might call him that, had as well. And, and so yeah, that, that was sort of built out in the cut and that took a little bit of, that took a bunch of massaging. Uh, it took a lot of, um, Rick was really trying to articulate what he wanted and um, it wasn't necessarily there in the footage as shot. So we, we did have to sort of just keep playing with it and pushing it to get it to do what it, you know, we wanted it to do. Yeah. But yeah, we, in the end it was very successful and I think it was very tense and very special. Moment. There's a lot of imagination involved in cutting things like this too. When, you know, like Andrew's episode or Dana's episode where you have like the big bad guy in the scene isn't there in the dailies. And, you know, thank goodness for not only just pre the action scenes, but the entire episodes, we all got our chance to kind of like really refine the whole episode in animation form and then when we got the dailies, it was kind of a whole new beast because it was like, well, now that I see it here and I feel it and the pace is all different, it's, you know, it's changed. My process for editing, like Andrew likes to watch dailies and watch everything. This might bite me in the ass, but I'm going to say it anyway. I don't like watching dailies. I like looking for the shot that I want to cut to next. And I try to find the shot that I want to see. And in doing so, I'll end up scrubbing through everything. But sometimes I'll find these little bits of magic and, and that weren't intended for this, but it's the one I'm looking for. And because we have characters without faces, you can really use it anywhere. Or because there's not an IG-11 or a Mudhorn or an ATSD there, you can kind of use these little pieces as you see fit 
and 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 make it work for your purposes, not necessarily what it was intentionally shot for. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, I, I have to let you all go soon, but uh, it's what's really amazing too about this whole team. You have the three, uh, the four of you. It's take up three nomination slots in this category, and it's also the first Emmy nomination for you all. Um, so congratulations on that. Was it? I did. You all have a similar chat on uh, on Emmy nomination morning with everyone together. <laughs> What had happened, I'm currently working on another movie and um, I, I went into a visual effects review at eight o'clock in the morning, even though I knew the Emmy nominations were being announced, I had totally forgotten about it. Andrew had <laughs> texted us and basically said, hey guys, I think we all just got nominated. So an hour later, I go on, didn't hear anything back from anybody else, but my, my phone started te get, uh, getting text messages galore. My phone started ringing. I started getting emails. I went and looked and it was like, blew my mind that all of us were nominated. It was surreal, right? It was totally surreal. surreal. And yeah. so I texted I, no, I actually tried FaceTiming you guys. You FaceTimed me, that's what Jeff I thought. was the only one to answer, and he had no clue. He <laughs> thought I was just pulling his leg. You know, I, I'm, I was trying to fix my dryer, and I had NPR <laughs> in the background, and I overheard them say that the Mandalorian got nominated for Best Dram Dramatic Series, and I was like, oh, that's really cool. Didn't even cross my mind that we would have been recognized in any way, shape, or form. I thought and then I looked at my phone, I see 25 missed text messages, and then right then, Dana gives me a FaceTime. I'm like, what happened? What's going on here? <laughs> it's a, a complete honor, a, yeah. a big surprise. Yeah. Yeah. Completely honored, and I mean, just to be nominated with, yes. with all of us together on separate episodes is a huge... Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's just overwhelming. And if I could just add before I leave, I want to, I have to really call out Dave Filoni and John Favreau, who are the creators of the show, um, for putting this, for making this all happen. And, and really, I have them to thank the most, A, for giving me and I think all of us the chance to mm -hmm. be part of this and, and for coming up with just such an original creative show. And look, we, we, um, on November 20, whatever day the, the, the release was, the day before, we were all sitting in a review together and going, God, I wonder if this thing's even like, how is this, this yeah. thing could tank? We don't know. And no one really knew. And it was just such a great, it was so gratifying to see the response that the audience had for the show. And, um, and, and for, we're great, I'm grateful as much for that as for the Emmy. The, the Emmy is the icing on the cake, the yeah. Emmy nomination, I should say. And, um, and look, and I think it's, look, we all thought, well, God, what happens if one of us gets nominated and the other one doesn't? So it's great that we're all together. And you know, <laughs> at, at this point, whoever, if either, if any one of us wins or none of us wins, I think the, uh, the nomination was, was the recognition that we uh, really, is, is very important. And, it's hugely and, yeah, flattering and a great honor. Flattering. Yeah. You took the words out of my mouth about uh, Dave and Jeff or Dave and John Filoni, um, Dave Filoni and John Favreau. I'm going to interrupt you, Dana. I do have Again? to run. Okay. I'm sorry, but well, I'm going to We are out of time anyway, so we're going to uh, close it up here. So thank you all. This is the nominated team. Dana, I'm sorry. Andrew, Dana, Jeff, Dylan, thank you so much for joining me. And thank you so if you're much. out there thank watching, so subscribe much. to Culture. Thank you. Thank you. for chapter eight. The, the <laughs> oh, yeah. Jeff. <laughs> Just to be child. nominated. We're winners just yeah, by we're, we're, we're already winners. Love it. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Thank Sam. You. Sam.